in that you mentioned something that I had never heard before, and that was that you actually thought, you, you felt that you could have stopped the whole Colorado River storage project if you just stuck to your gun. And uh, I, I just, I can't believe it. <laughs> no, I, I guess I just, I, um, well, we had a lot of support. I just wanted you guys to riff on that for a minute. I don't know if I'm. You want just a quick one out of me and then let Dave say his big thing? Yeah. <laughs> you guys got him down, huh? <laughs> we had, have no idea what he's going to say. No, no it's fair. Pretend you believe it. The director of the National Park Service himself, when we were fighting the first stages of the Colorado River storage project, the dams in Dinosaur National Monument, he said, dinosaur is a dead duck. He gave up before we did, director of the National Park Service. Then any of those uh, projects, in any of those projects, we had allies who were strong, and politicians, and the strength was economic and so forth, but that was Southern California. Southern California didn't like the idea of anything impeding the flow of the Colorado River or costing water or losing water, evaporating or anything else because the hope was that it would all come down that way. And uh, there was a big fight in the Supreme Court of Arizona, Arizona claiming that the Gila and the Salt Rivers shouldn't be counted against their share because those were their rivers. Well, they begin in New Mexico, so Arizona really didn't have any right to them either. But, uh, I don't know that it could have been stopped, but we certainly were on a roll. Uh, the President of the United States, Dwight Eisenhower, the President of the United States, Dwight Eisenhower, stood up before the world and said, the dams in Dinosaur National Monument will be built. And several secretaries of the interior that he went through uh, said the same thing. And there was a great deal of opposition to our side push, 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 those were the dam building days. And uh, so who knows what we could have done about Glen Canyon, but in the Sierra Club hierarchy, there was this, uh, uh, you know, run up to the uh, victory sign and then stop just short of it uh, attitude uh, that uh, uh, since it wasn't a national park or monument, we really didn't have any business opposing what was happening there. That was one attitude. Of course, that Glen Canyon at one time was destined to be the greatest of all national parks when Helen Gahagan Douglas, a member of Congress from uh, California, uh, introduced legislation to that effect, the Escalante National Park, which would have been the, an area that would have been tremendous. It would have taken all the canyons. And uh, I don't know, we let that one slide because of World War II took our interest away from it, really. It happened during the Roosevelt administration that it was proposed. And uh, that would have stopped Glen Canyon Dam, I suppose. But uh, what, uh, what could have been done, we'll never know. I know Dave likes to blame himself for a lot of things, including uh, Glen Canyon Dam, but uh, uh, he was awfully busy with other things at that time. And we really didn't concentrate on it. And the Redwoods, Grand Canyon dams coming up, all kinds of other issues. And uh, the old guard in the Sierra Club was really not on board. We didn't have them geared up for this. There was opposition to Glen Canyon Dam, uh, but basically it didn't come out of the Sierra Club. That would have been the end of the uh, Colorado River Storage Project. Uh, as it exists today anyway. And Lake Mead would still be functioning, of course, because it had been there for a long time. Um, Martin's always... I know I didn't say anything. Right? No, you did. You know, the thing is, Martin's always been the great proponent of no compromise. And we're, you're talking to a generation of compromisers here. I'm a good one myself. And okay. it strikes me, it, you know, you guys, it fell to you guys you saw all this stuff. There was all this stuff that our generation, I mean, we just kind of heard about Glen Canyon and 
a lot of, in a lot of these other places. You guys actually saw him, and then you saw him go. Um, I'll just say one thing more. If you're willing to compromise, you've set yourself up to lose everything. If you start off with a willingness to compromise, you've given up. Uh, you've lost. After all, even though the final result, in most cases, is a compromise, uh, it's a compromise that was reached between two sides, each of which was adamant and was not going to give in. Um, it was once said in a Sierra Club publication, the only way we'd ever accomplished anything was through compromise and accommodation. That's exactly the opposite of the truth. The only way the Sierra Club ever won anything was by refusing to compromise. Grand Canyon dams, Redwood National Park, you could go right back through the whole list. When we compromised, we lost. And uh, I'm through. Well, um, Dave hasn't said a word, so I think I ought to go and do my thing. Or do you want us to talk to each other? Well, uh, maybe Martin would like to respond to what I tell him. Uh, that would be interesting. Well, hurry up because I'm in, in five minutes. I'm out of here. You stay. They'll take you back. I got interested in dinosaurs simply because it was a national monument, part of the national park system. We'd lost a very important unit in Hetch Hetchy in Yosemite. I didn't want to see it happen again. That was my interest. One of our former presidents of the Sierra Club, a dam builder at that, Walter Huber, said this was nothing but a bunch of sagebrush. And then another president of the Sierra Club, Harold Bradley, took his family, and he had seven sons, so it was quite a family, down through dinosaur by boat and made a movie of it. And when I saw that movie, I was sold. That place had to be sold, saved, no matter what. So I got very excited about the whole thing and spent all the rest months and months and months becoming expert on everything I possibly could to help. And the first thing I thought of when we got into the congressional hearings was a compromise indeed, the biggest compromise of all. That in order to save Echo Park and Split Mountain from being dammed, we put all that water in a bigger Grand Canyon Dam. And I was the guy who advocated that Grand Canyon Dam be built higher. River runners in Salt Lake got after me on that one and said, what the hell are you up to? You haven't seen it, have you? And you don't know what you're talking about. And that was right. But beyond that, the Bureau of Reclamation's commissioner said, we would have difficulty protecting Rainbow Bridge if it were higher. And we have considered, we have serious doubts about the foundation of Glen Canyon itself. They didn't want to make it any higher. That quote needs to come out again. They were concerned then about it. They should be concerned more now. But then the battle came on. And as the battle went on and on, I saw that there were other things wrong with the whole project. It was a bum project. It was too expensive. It was taxpayer expense, all, of, all the bad things. And we had plenty of people with us on that. We knew that it was bad engineering. I knew that from Walter Huber, who was the dam expert for Bryson and Eisenhower. And we knew from Linda Leopold, one of our best hydrologists of the U.S. Geological Survey, that they were not thinking right about sedimentation and aggradation. And I got going in those subjects and got really excited about it. We had a very bad project. It was going to waste water. I had no idea how much then. And it was a bad idea altogether. And we had enough people ready to, to oppose that, that we had, right at that point, a block of 200 votes in the House of Representatives to shoot it down. And they would have enough trade votes to kill it. At that point, when it was, I think, on the ropes, and the whole reclamation program on the ropes with it, I got a wire when I was lobbying in, in, back in Washington from the executive committee of the Sierra Club saying, if Echo Park and Split Mountain Dams are taken out of the project, the Sierra Club will withdraw its opposition to the entire project. They didn't really know much about the whole project because they hadn't been thinking about that. They'd just been thinking about the National Monument President. When they did that, the people who were trying along with us to block the dam realized that with the Sierra Club out of this, it was the keystone on the opposition. The opposition would fade and the project would go through, which it did. 
But the thing that bothers me still is that when that decision came by wire from San Francisco to Washington, instead of grabbing the next plane home and getting the board to meet and squaring them out, giving them the story about this, look, this project is wrong on all these projects, all these bases, and besides, it violates the Sierra Club's own project. There should be no major scenic resource lost for a power project. But I didn't get off my duff. I didn't move. And I don't know yet to this day exactly why I didn't. And that was the difference. I could have made the difference at that point. I was the one person who could have. I had all these pieces to work with. And they didn't. And I didn't make that trip. There was an excuse for me later that, uh, well, I hadn't seen it yet. Or I'd have been as excited about that as I was about dinosaur. I hadn't seen it indeed. But whatever the reason, I was in a position to keep the Sierra Club intact, to keep the opposition intact. And Senator Paul Douglas asked, why did you quit? And Senator Clinton Anderson, a great reclamationist, said, if it hadn't gone through then, it would never have gone through. So I had this hanging over my head ever since, until last November, 40 years plus after that disastrous move by the Sierra Club board, the board voted unanimously to drain Lake Powell, to let the river run through it. So this is what, where we are now, and we have the chance. And among all the other reasons we know now, things that we didn't know then, that what is imminent at Glen Canyon is an economic catastrophe beyond belief for Arizona, California, and Nevada, because that dam is not in good shape and it's going to be in worse shape. We damn near lost it in, in 1983. We've got enough water to lose it again if they don't play it right. And it's weaker than it was. And besides that, we're losing a lot of water we didn't know we were losing, a lot by evaporation, and a lot because we have this huge reservoir with a lot of thirsty deserts on all the sides. And as a result right now, we're losing something like one and a half million acre feet of water a year because of the great Lake Powell mistake. We don't need to, and that's what we've got to stop. We've got to let the water go through, let the sedimentation go through to Lake Mead. When Lake Mead is finished, maybe a century or two from now, that would be time to rethink Glen. If anybody at that point wants to make that kind of mistake again, I don't think they will, but we'll leave that option. That's the compromise. Leave it there, repair it, and fix up these very serious flaws in the, in the foundation, around the edges, and what evaporation can do, in the spillways, and the cavitation, and the sedimentation that was not considered. They don't know what they're doing. And as that spills up more and more, then the lake spreads out more and more. And there's more to be lost by, by bank storage and evaporation than now. So now is as good as it's going to be. It's going to get worse. And this river can't afford that kind of waste. So it's a matter of let's have better water, better quality, more of it, and stop putting a great scenic resource out of action because we want to make hydroelectric power when that, these days, is old fashioned. The great scenic resource meaning Glen, Glen Canyon. Glen Canyon itself was one of the greatest scenic resources on earth. And when we restore that, people are going to have a chance to learn that. And they'll never let it happen again, in my judgment. But meanwhile, there are lots of alternatives. And we're concentrating on those. The other things that can make the people who think they're unhappy, happy about this project, which they should be. Do you disagree? Lincoln like Run was what? <laughs> which which? No, no. no they can run river tours instead of lake tours. Well, okay. for one thing, that they, they can build, as Moab has done, they can build a recreational resource and grow and profit out of the Colorado River without a reservoir. That's upstream. They've done very well. Page and the other places along there, but the places now dependent upon input and output, and a lot of boats can right. think of something else to do. Move the boats, the flat water structures, down to Lake Mead. There'll be more water, more power. And get the pollution that those create out of the system. 
And one thing that I didn't learn until about two months ago is that with all this flat water recreation and all the motorboats and everything else like that, the water skis, the two-stroke motor causes 50 times as much pollution as a four-stroke motor. Sure. And we don't need it. And if you took the, the garbage that comes from just a little exercise of a two-stroke motor and you saved that and you poured that in San Francisco Bay, that would be a felony. And you'd go to jail, you'd get a big fine. But you put it in your motorboat and they don't care what happens. But we have to care about this. This is the kind of pollution, it's a big number. In this country, in the flat water, work with motorboats, the two-stroke engine, is causing as much pollution as two Exxon Valdez spills, as 12. 12 Exxon Valdez spills are going on every year in our careless use of this two-stroke engine. And we better wake up to that and cut it out. And we can. I'm, uh, well, I'm trying to see, I'm, uh, Martin, well. No, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to say that I wouldn't even give a thought to predicting a future for which there would be any point in uh, fixing up Glen Canyon Dam. Um, I think that's defeatist. Um, even though it, you're looking at 200 years from now, when there won't be any people anyway, um, it, it's, still, it's still giving the enemy a little bit of a point here and there. Uh, if the dam shouldn't be there, if it shouldn't impound water, it shouldn't impound water. And there's got to be another alternative better than that uh, to replace Lake Mead. Uh, uh, well, the best thing, of course, would be to, to depopulate Southern California. Remember, when you have water wars, as we've had all over the Colorado River for all these years, and then you look at the results, it's not those who give up or lose the water who suffer, it's those who get it. Look what happened to Southern California. Garden spot of the universe, and now it's shunned and abhorred by people because of cheap water, now because wait. it was able to grow. You mean it's shunned and abhorred by people because why? Just spell that out. Well, people who like to uh, put down L.A. Maybe because they don't live there, I don't know. Because it's so populated in there. Well, it's so overpopulated, the traffic, everything that goes with wealth. The wealth came from water. Water came in, watered the farms, and now the cities. And uh, cheap, pure, easy water destroyed Southern California. The Colorado River was sort of the last straw. The Owens River was one thing. Well, not, not the Colorado, the California aqueduct. After all, this water is going to a place where it doesn't belong, to a region where it doesn't belong. And it's destroyed it. Um, you said you, that's too defeatist. That's given the enemy a point. Who's the enemy? Who is the enemy? Well, the enemy is the, in one word or two or three words, the growth addict, the, the, those who, are, who see nothing but development, industry, civilization, subdue and populate the earth. That's a great credo in Utah, you know. That's what they live on, that's a religion. And uh, that's what we've done, that's how we've hurt the earth, and now, now we're hurting ourselves with it. Water to Southern California didn't do anything any good, it hurt it. And it's no longer the place that it was, even in my childhood. I mean, with California having 12 to 13 times as many people as it did when I was a teenager, can you imagine? That's a short span in history, you know. Uh, well, it, the, it's a, yeah, it's pretty mind-boggling. But how, how on earth are we gonna turn the clock back? I mean, real, I mean, seriously, you, as far as we can. I say this isn't a matter of turning the clock back, it's keeping the clock running. And our institutions don't have that idea yet. That means the corporations, the government, the universities, 
the investors, we haven't got the message yet. It hasn't caught through. We don't get it. Just one number. It comes from Paul Hawkins, who wrote the book, The Ecology of Commerce. It's not in that book, but I think it'll be in his next one. If things go on as they're going on, we're going to have to produce as much food around the world in the next 40 years as has been produced in the last 8,000 years. Now, you may not want to believe that, but you better not disbelieve it till you prove that it's wrong. Because we've got into this exponential curve of growth and demand and research. We're going right up the wall. We, we're getting along reasonably well here, but we're going right up the wall, and the wall isn't going to take it. We cannot produce that 8,000 years supply of food. It's out of the question. But we don't have any of our institutions, no presidents, no exec vice presidents, no, no, you take any option, no university president is thinking about this. It's time to rethink what we do with water, what we do with energy, and what we do with growth. And we're, we've got to do it. We don't have much time to do it. So I, I'm worried about taking too long to get this started. If we make Glen Canyon an example, we let the river run through it. I have no doubt, you know, I have nothing to prove it with, but that about 150 years from now, when we really need something like it as a substitute for Lake Mead, that no one will permit it. But if we try now to keep it, to take it down now, we've got the huge budget of taking it apart. That's huge. Right now, for example, there's been general agreement that a dam should be taken down in, up near Olympic National Park, the Elwha River Dam. But it's been blocked by a mere $150 million problem. They think it's going to cost that much to take the sediment out. So nothing has happened. And the Department of the Interior wants to do it. People want to get it done. But they're stuck in the budget because we get stuck on budgets. We are incapable right now of thinking what it's going to cost the Earth and the future if we don't do some of these things. All we think about is what it's going to cost us if we do it now. And to hell with the future, to hell with the Earth. And we've trashed the Earth for a good 250 years since the Industrial Revolution. We've been very good at it. And nobody has been better than we in the United States. But we can do something else. We don't have to trash it anymore. We can run a society that doesn't require that the earth be trashed. We're bright enough to do that. I have full confidence in that. And that's what we've got to get going on. So I'm willing to let the dam stand as an example. That was a silly act. Why the hell did they ever put that up in the first place? Let that be the tourist attraction, the horrible example. And once people really understand what Glen Canyon was as it begins to restore, and it will begin immediately once you get the water out of it, they will never let that happen again. They would never let Hesh Hetchy happen again in Yosemite. It's a new world coming up, a new bunch of thinking on dams. That was a great idea. It's time has passed, and it's time for us to realize that. Well, I don't have to say these things because you know them already. But demographers tell us right, who they are. More than half the people who have ever lived are living today. And so no matter what we do, this is, a, this is our challenge. What can we do when probably 90% of the Earth's population doesn't give a hoot what happens in 100 years? They don't care. It's what I can get now, what I can live on. Many of them starving, 75%. That's conservative. The Earth's population is on what we would call starvation rations. And uh, the numbers are growing all the time. And so we have massacres again, you know, great losses. We used to have famines. Now we have people killing each other. And uh, so we, we have this challenge. We've got to set the example in our own country. And when people say population stabilization, that says status quo, that we'll get along. We can survive on, with the number of people we have. And it's one of the bitterest things for me to mention or to even acknowledge that population stabilization won't work. Population reduction is the only thing that'll work. And when I look around at young people and I 
think back to my younger days when it was children in the family that made our lives so happy. What watch them grow up, have three or four of them, and, and love them and, and uh, live for them and have happy times together. How can we look forward to that if, if it just means they're all going to survive? When I was a kid, they got scarlet fever, you got diphtheria, you got typhoid, you got, kids didn't live as long. It was a big, relatively big death rate. And now they can save you from anything. So we're, we're not, the population is not going to stay stable. Uh, no matter what we do, it's going to go up or down. And uh, uh, having it go down as a result of, when you look around the world, disease, starvation and all that, is the tragic thing. And this situation exists because people would not, maybe could not, don't know how, to control our numbers. Uh, and the bad here. He had three children. We had four. So we're senior on this. And I went to a different demographer. My demographer said that the six billion people we have roughly now are but one sixteenth of the number of people who ever lived. A hundred billion people have lived on this earth. That's the number I get from my demographer. But there isn't any need to argue about that number. Because what's happening now is that we have to think about the trend. And the trend is absolutely unattainable, unsustainable, unmanageable. And you've got to realize that and begin to take the steps we're right enough to take not to do it. To redesign everything, including our thinking, some of our habits. But we don't have to get the fun out of it. It can be more fun living in an earth that is not determined to drown itself in gridlock and what my wife calls greedlock. It doesn't have to happen. We don't have to do that. And I think there are a lot of people that are ready to change, but they haven't accepted, they're not in any positions of leadership yet among the governments of the world, or among the universities, or among the corporate leaders, but that's changing. You guys keep going now, and I'm going to have to duck out. They're going to take you back to the motel. Uh, I've got to go. Okay. I've said everything I know. <coughs> Thanks, Lou. Lou, give me a clap or, or tap the mic. Okay, good deal. All right. Okay. From the engineering standpoint, it was flawed, not safe. Uh, the evaporation loss uh, would be didn't add up, and the bank storage well, didn't add up. We did get the numbers on the evaporation, and those numbers are still pretty sound. We're not arguing much about those. The bureau. Fudges a bit now and then, but then they, they tell the truth every now and then, too. Water me? Yes. Do you just uh, want to hold on to it? The <laughs> chat. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's still okay. again. You got enough? Do you still oh, yeah, it? no, we're fine. It didn't, yeah. We didn't do a... Uh, yeah. We didn't do a sink thing. This might be mm -hmm. your wife calling. Not anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh -oh. You had one. Um, why do you suppose they keep that lake so full, even on a wet year like this? We keep it full because we're a little chintzy. The higher the head, the more hydroelectric power can be produced, and the more income to pick up the tab on all these little goodies that were part of the Colorado River participating projects, including the Central Utah project, and including no small part of the Central Arizona project and all these other little, little projects going along the other little dams. There's a lot that came out of that Christmas tree at Glen, Glen, at Glen Canyon because nobody, nobody in the marketplace or anybody else was ready to calculate the costs. They, they took cheap money. They took a place without paying anything for it, one of the most beautiful places on earth. They created a catastrophe, the possibility of a catastrophe. They created mindless growth. They did all kinds of things without quite thinking them through. Now, I don't expect to think anything through, even in my 84 plus years. But at least you make a try at it. And our minds are good enough to make a try at this. I was in intelligence in World War II in the mountain troops in Italy. In intelligence, you're told, 
gather information, evaluate it, interpret it, and do something about it. And one of the things you're supposed to do in the course of all this is to consider what the enemy capabilities are. Well, I wouldn't call enemy here the, the enemy nature, but nature is one. And the other enemies are the people who are sick and tired of the United States using up most of the world's resources. The number I have is that in the last 50 years, the United States has used up more resources than all the rest of the world in all previous history. Extremely hard to believe. I'm not sure I believe it myself. But I certainly believe this seems to be our direction, that we're determined to do this. And I like Rene Devos' remark, trend, and this is the trend, is not destiny. We don't, we're not committed to this stupidity. We're brighter than that. We're a hell of a lot brighter than that. And I just would like us to catch on to how brilliant we are and stop, stop turning our heads away from problems, from opportunities we can handle. That's this deep down, deep dish philosophy here. And it's, uh, as you get older, you get into it deeper and deeper. And uh, I guess this happens when, because I followed the example of Ansel Adams, who said, if you're going to get old, get as old as you can get. And that's what I'm up to. <laughs> well, you don't seem to lack for optimism either. No, I, that just, this is the, the, great, the great point of, of Paul Hawkins, that we do have to redesign everything. And here's some examples of this. And one of them is that they redesigned the 3M company. They redid every process they had so they would cut their contribution to the waste stream. Over a 15-year period, they cut it in half, and they made half a billion dollars more profit by doing it right. Now, this is the example that needs to go through the corporate world. Have you any plans for doing it right? <laughs> Try it. It might be fun. You might make even more money if that's what you're into. The earth could certainly feel relieved. And I like to tell people in my audiences, there's nobody in the audience who between now and sack time couldn't think of at least three things that need to be redesigned. And I'll give a couple of examples, just a simple-minded one. The low flush toilet. How many do they have in Arizona? We finally got one in our house. We've been in that house for 50 years. We got two, as a matter of fact, instead of the others. And I've done my rough calculation. If we got those 50 years ago, we'd have saved $3,000 in water bills. No, that would have been worth trying, I think. But anyhow, that's, that's a, a, a number, just a number. But there, there are more things than that. It's the beer can. Remember when you pulled off the cab and tossed it away somewhere and that was environmentally unsound? Mm -hmm. So somebody said, well, we'll fix it so you don't take it all. You just loosen it and then you recycle the can. Simple redesign. And then I come to what the trade opportunity is now. I've got several, but my favorite is a seat belt. Why can't Detroit, which has billions and billions of cars with seat belts in them, be as smart about designing a seat belt as the airline industry is? You get your seat belt on an airplane and here it is and you put it together. You get in your car, and well now, what kind of car have I got? Where is it? How do you get it all out at once if that's what you have to do? And then where the hell is this thing you're supposed to hook it up to? And if you ever hook it up, can you unhook it? And it is just, all you had to do is get both these elements where you could see them. And Detroit isn't smart enough to do that, but that figures. But we're smart enough to do that. <laughs> And people just start redesigning, start rethinking. Because the earth is just trying for this effort on our part, since we seem to so determined, unlike any other species, to trash it. Well, Glenn Kennan Dam obviously has a lot of symbolic importance yeah. to, to you and I guess everybody else too. And this, this is rethinking dams, but it's rethinking. I, I went along with this. I want. Uh, a rehab, rehabilitation of the entire Colorado River drainage. Why does it flow so muddy? Because we've done such damage, some stupid things upstream. Well, let's cut it out. We've got lots of people who need work. Let's cut those people to work the way they did back in FDR's day and fix it. There are plenty of people who could. There's plenty to be fixed. 
while it continued to be erosive, eroded, unnecessary, so on. I could go on endlessly, and I usually do. You should quit while you're ahead. <laughs> oh no, I think we're. Uh, <coughs> how are you doing, Doogie? Do you need to? Do you need us to? We'll, we will go on as long as we can stand it. Are you? You have that look on your face. Do you need to get? Can't stand yeah, it. Uh, I just. I uh. No, what's your schedule like? Well, my wife is probably wondering where the hell I am. Because I was just supposed to come over and so somebody had taken a couple of pictures. Uh huh. And, what and she, thought, she thought I was going to do that at the, the days in office. Uh, Strange addiction to growth. And where we got it, I don't know. But where you can't find anybody who will say anything about you got to have more growth. And I, I started questioning that about oh, 30 or 40 years ago. And we can't have more growth much longer. But we're still trying. We're still acting as if we could grow and grow and grow. Yes, the population of the Earth is up to factor of threes in my lifetime, 80, 80 plus years. But then, if you start looking at the things that have happened just in my 80 years, you'll realize we can't do it again. Simple example. In California, in the Great Valley of California, where we produce, I'm a Californian bragging, one quarter of the food America eats. We had 6,000 miles of salmon streams. We're down to fewer than 200, and the farmers don't like that. You can't do that again. We had something like 75% of the original redwoods. We're down to 4%. You can't do that again. We had a sardine fishery. We don't have it. You can't do that again. Now, these are the things that you can't do again, and nobody wants to think about that. It's just, oh, there'll always be more. High tech and science will fix this. High tech and science are adding about two problems, at least to everyone they solve. Maybe more. I, I would rather think of ten, ten to one, but it's, it's happening. And another problem we haven't solved is how to get the marketplace to give us some numbers that we can think with. The marketplace is, I would just say, out and out stupid. I give them my simple example, what's the value of a tree? The marketplace will say what it's good for for pulp or two by fours. That's it. Nothing about what it does for carbon dioxide balance. That's rather important if you don't like global warming. Nothing about what it does for oxygen. And I rather like it myself. I use it myself. Nothing about what it does for keeping the soil in place. Clear cutting is a very sophisticated device of getting soil downstream to the nearest reservoir as possible, fast as possible. Doesn't say a thing about habitat. And habitat, the forest is the habitat for millions of species, most of which haven't been discovered yet. And then it doesn't say anything about the quality and quantity of water. Trees are great sponges, and they have this release system, sustained release. Marketplace doesn't ignore that. And they're beautiful. None of that stuff, all critical, is given this worth a fig, mm -hmm. not even a fig, to the marketplace. And that isn't bright. I don't know how long they can continue not being at least bright enough to realize that these things exist. They are valuable. They are subsidizing everything we think we're doing that's so smart. Nature is paying our way, and we're kicking in the teeth. And I don't think that works. And we're trying to work it, and, do good. and we're going to solve our problems while we're getting into our problem. Well, the only thing to do is have more growth, so we'll have more money to pay off the old debt or something. Some strange quirk has told us we can go on growing and growing and growing. I remember in San Jose, when was once said of San Jose, which is now our third largest city in, in Southern California. It's Los Angeles, San Diego, San Jose, then San Francisco. When I was born in Berkeley, San Jose was smaller than Berkeley. All right, so I was asking a bunch of planners who were coming up with what they were doing about transportation, all that. And they had some good ideas, but I said, have you thought of when you would like to see San Jose stop growing? They didn't want to hear it. Didn't want it to stop growing. They didn't growing. want to hear it. They didn't want to discuss that. It was just never, it didn't cross their threshold. And uh, pardon me if I sound excited about this, but this damn mill has got to cross our threshold. We cannot continue being that stupid. And we aren't 
destined to be that stupid. We've got extraordinary minds. There are incredible things we can do. But maybe it's just television. <laughs> As I was just telling you, a panel at Stanford once, chaired by Ted Koppel, television is causing cerebral gridlock across America. He didn't like that statement very much, so we had a discussion. But it is. Somehow, we cannot be that bright if we're going to just stand here and have the screen give us stuff all the time, day in and day out. Well, you know, and, and change channels. It's funny, you guys used it at just the gerrymander ads. Uh, it's kind of ironic, it's always been ironic to me that you punched up the arguments the way that you did in order to stop that, to stop those dams in the Grand Canyon. But I think when, I, when you talk about television doing us in, what strikes me is that it's the that the people who are making the commercials are really good. You know, they want you to go buy that stuff and mm -hmm. they're getting, and yeah. that's where all the money is and those guys are really good at what they do. But then what, what happens when you don't do your own thinking? Because when I was teaching in, in the Army, I, I taught, that's one of the things an officer's supposed to do is teach. And you, you give a good demonstration, you give a good explanation, and it's supposed to be practical work and there's a test. So we get, in television, we get explanation, we get some demonstration, but it's pretty well biased. And the, but there's no practical work you have to do. All you have to do is go out and buy. And then, then beyond that, there is no test. Is this working? What has this done to you? What have you learned from this that's going to help you, your family, the earth, or whatever you think is important these days? Like quality. What's it doing? Yeah. Pretty close to zip. And I watch a lot. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, well, just this is the absolute last one. <laughs> Two more minutes. We, it's just these people in page. Uh, I mean, I've had, I. You want to shoot me? You didn't see the, the that article in the latest Economist. No. And the guy who managed some, does some boat business in page says he's involved with us. All that to be lined up and shot, every one of them. <laughs> so I was thinking twice about, well, do I want to go to Page right now, considering all the crazies we've got around, including Page? But uh, Page has got great opportunities. That they can be the takeoff point for trips down the Grand Canyon, the takeoff point for trips up Lake Powell. They can be the supplier for whatever happens at the revised Huawei, where, yes, they've got their hotel and so on. And they're not going to have all those boats, but they can have something else, something besides flat water recreation. There's a lot of non-flat water recreation in this country. It's a big business. Get into it. And to go on from there, just figure out how we're going to get some water up from Glen for the 30,000 acre feet you need for the Navajo generating station. Keep that on for a while and try to get a polluting glass. But there are all kinds of things they can do if they use their imagination. And so far as the people who want their houseboats, I'd say, well, if Glen Canyon Dam goes one way or the other, their houseboats will all be in Lake Mead anyway. So, but rethink what to do with flat water recreation at Lake Mead, and rethink what could be done with the exquisite terrain, scenery. But if you just want to call it scenery, it's too cheap. But this extraordinary example, ge geography, of geography, of, of, well, I'll call it geography, book as well as signal wood. Think of what can be done once we say, let's use this and use it in ways that maximize the effect of this place on its visitors and then minimize the effect of it of, by them, of them upon it. These are things that can be thought through. And all you have to do is start thinking about it and coming up with the imagination, the ideas. Page doesn't have to disappear at all. And if we keep Glen Canyon down around as a, just a tourist attraction for a while, you can run up and down it and you can see how much water leaks in it and through it. And you can watch uh, which was leaking, which you can't see anymore if there's no more in the lake. But all these things could happen at Page. And I guess if anybody wants to hear me say it, I'll tell them up there. I got a few notes. Um, I don't know. I, I just, uh, I, I find myself 
running into all those logistical questions, you know, when, I mean, when you try to literally think of, think it through step by step, how are we going to do this thing? Mm -hmm. I think it's pretty amazing that, that, uh, people are actually standing up and saying this, that we're seeing this. I'm, I was quite surprised. Well, I'm surprised and surprised at the number of people who buy it. Yeah. They say, hey, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> And then all I have to do is just try to remember my own family's experience when we were taking the few trips we took before Lake Bell Phil. We watched the filling begin. But before any of it had happened, we went up a good many of the side canyons. What? That was one of the greatest experiences our family had in our lives. And uh, I mean, when I was going through there with John McPhee and Floyd Downey some years ago and the book Encounters with the Arts Druid. We reached a point where we were in Cathedral Canyon, and John McPhee said he was watching Dave, but he wasn't watching very closely. He was, he was seeing I was crying. Because I remember what it was like for my kids, going through, exploring this place, just loving every minute of it, going from pool to pool, and being up from pool to pool, up the slippery stuff, on up, up till the, the rather common stuff that gets up higher. But those beautiful things that happen in those side canyons are incredible. And I want to see them again. Fast. <laughs>